Brokeback Mountain was shocking when it came out in 1997. It was shocking to just about everybody who read it. And we can't even begin to get into some of the more subtle uh, dynamics in the text until we might look at this question is, oh my gosh, what just happened? Very soon in the book, uh, only a handful of pages in, we're reading this nice story about two uh, young sheep herders up on a mountain, lots of nature, uh, odd little going back and forth. They seem to be getting on just fine. And all of a sudden, ah, what happens in that tent one night? All of a sudden, there is a description, an explicit description of a sexual encounter between these two dudes. And we are surprised. We are surprised partially because uh, we, we live in a heteronormative society. We expect uh, eroticism and sexual encounters between men and women. That's sort of a cultural reason. We're not expecting these two guys to get at it. We're brought up in that culture. And with that culture, we all form these sort of uh, uh, normalized expectations. But we're not just members of a heteronormative culture. We're also the recipients of the Western Romantic tradition. We've read about lovers coming together in the gardens of the Song of Songs. We've looked at Paolo and Francesca's story. We've listened to all those love lyrics, love songs, again and again and again about a man loves a woman. We are seeped in a tradition where um, eroticism is tied to heterosexual courtship, that it is the culmination that a sexual, sexual intimacy in the Western Romantic tradition is a culmination of testing, of discernment, of trust, of courtship, of back and forth, and then the celebration that, oh yes, we really are meant for each other, we're the ones. So that Western Romance tradition gives us lots of uh, textual foreplay, lots of hints that what's coming up is going to be the, uh, a loving consummation, a physical consummation of really strong emotional feelings. And in the face of that culture, in the face of that reading tradition, here's what this text gives us. And I'm going to read it because I think it is um, shocking, it's unique, it's jarring in all kinds of special ways. So Jack and Ennis uh, have just met. They're just shy of 20 years old. They've met in uh, a tiny little ranch town. They've been hired to go up onto the mountain. And the deal is, of course, that um, uh, one of them at night goes off with the sheep comes back in the morning so that uh, the sheep have somebody guarding them all the time. And this, it turns out, is not as pleasant as one might think. People are really far away. It's cold outside and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, so, so one night they've gotten uh, together a little bit. Um, they've been hanging out. They've been sharing whiskey uh, by uh, a whole bottle of whiskey by shares. Uh, they're drunk. It's late and it's cold. And Jack or Ennis starts to fall asleep, um, uh, passing out by the fire as the as the sun goes down. And here's what happens. This is on page 14. And if you have the same version as I, uh, Jesus Christ, quit hammering and get over here. Bedroll's big enough, said Jack in an irritable, sleep clogged voice. It was big enough, warm enough, and in a little while, they deepened their intimacy considerably. Huh? So first of all, this is not, hey, honey, want to get, uh, hey, honey, want to get, uh, want to get busy? This is two tired, drunken, uh, half-asleep, freezing, rough ranch hands trying to get through the night. It was big enough, warm enough, and in a little while they deepened their intimacy considerable. Now there's an understatement. Innes ran full throttle on all roads, whether fence mending or money spending, and he wanted none of it 
when Jack seized his left hand and brought it to his erect cock. Annis jerked his hand away as though he'd touched fire, got to his knees, unbuckled his belt, shoved his pants down, hauled Jack into all fours, and with the help of a little clear slick and a little spit entered him. Nothing he'd done before, but no instruction manual needed. They went at it in silence except for a few sharp intakes of breath, and Jack's choked, guns going off, then out, down, and asleep. So there is a, there is a very graphic depiction, an explicit uh, depiction uh, of a sex act. And it's, it's, it's prefaced with none of the flowery, romantic, approaching language that we're used to when we're reading romantic and erotic texts. In the Western Romantic edition, not only are the men, is the man and a woman getting together, but also there's flirtation. There's suggestion, there's hints, there's glances, there's looks, there's back and forth conversation, and none of that is present here. There's just a groggy voice, get in here. There's not even language. Jack puts, uh, puts Ennis' hand um, on his genitals, and Ennis jumps back, and almost at that point, we're almost expecting, the way it's written, that he's going to slug them. That, oh, you've crossed, you've crossed a physical boundary. And so then we're even more, we're surprised that it's happening. We're surprised at Jack's audacity. And then we're surprised that instead of getting a, a violent no, Ennis jumps back, and in fact, they don't just um, have physical sex play. They have, they have anal penetrative intercourse. They go for it as, as, uh, uh, as dramatically or as intensely or as aggressively as they can. It's the sexiest sex act. It's the most, um, uh, the most intimate, the most um, intense sex act that they could possibly do. And then the language, interestingly, he goes on all throttles a reference to the throttling of farm equipment. Um, uh, the language is hauling, clear slick, and a little spit, really specific S-sounding, um, hissing-sounding words about viscous fluids. Ick! Ick. It's, it's explicit. It's it's icky because we don't use that kind of language to talk in, in literature. We haven't seen this kind of language used to talk about. There's no, there's no high thee to the mountain of myrrh. There's no frankincense. There's no um, symbolic suggestion like we have seen in previous literature. It's very explicit and very um, a graphic. And then there's no language and they're done. So, ah, and I simply want to point out that a whole bunch of stuff has happened here. A, it's surprising because we don't expect you guys to get going. Uh, and B, uh, I think it's also surprising because in so many ways it, it, it violates the textual tradition that we're really, really used to. So that's one of the big difficulties, this, um, this new kind of... Um, uh, representation that has really outside the boundaries of a tradition as we've experienced it. And what are we to make of this? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like good sex. It's not arousing. It's not particularly titillating. This doesn't sound like, oh, I'd love, I'd love a piece of that. That sounds like fun. What it sounds like is it sounds like doing it like animals do it. On all fours, doggy style. Why would, why would these characters use the language that they would use? Gun going off. A euphemism uh, for talking about ejaculation. Why of all the positions, of all the way body parts can rub up against other body parts, why do they do a doggy style rear penetrate? Because that's in fact the sex that, that they have seen. If you are uh, an ignorant, uneducated, uh, isolated farmhand, what you know about sex has come from the farmyard, 
from watching those sheep go at it, watching the pigs in the stalls, and that's all that you know. These two uh, these two bodies have not had a whole lot of exposure to other representations, ways of being. So that animalistic um, physicality that is being represented is also, interestingly enough, at this point, also completely void of uh, emotion, of feeling, of, um, it seems to be really a primal, we could say base carnal, physical um, an action. And we don't see any of the psychology of love making, any of the emotion of love making, any of the flirtation of love making that we're expecting and acculturated to see above and beyond the fact that it's a same sex coupling. So, hmm, some interesting and also some difficulties. Another thing I want to say about difficulties, uh, while I can get it into this little mini lecture, is the difficulties of timing. Uh, we know that these guys meet at in 1963, and we know that the story ends in 1983, 63, and it goes to 1983, um, spanning a, a 20 year period. Uh, of these two guys. Um, these two guys meet. Four years later, there's the motel siesta, they meet again. We learn that every year or so, once or twice, there are fishing trips that go all the way up to 1983. And then we know that in 1983, uh, there's a May visit, a planned November visit, and Jack dies before that November visit can happen. So even though there is a 20-year um, uh, time span, in the narrative timing of the book, there's an awful lot of back and forth. The book actually starts in 1983. Ennis is alone. Um, Jack has died. He's alone in his trailer. He wakes up one morning after a dream, and it jumps all the way back to that summer of 1963 when they went back. The entire bulk of the story is a flashback. Uh, we learn a little bit about that first summer, um, and then we jump forward four years to the Motel Siesta interview. We jump forward a little back to 1973 about where he gets divorced, his his daughter is nine and seven. Uh, Annie Prue gives us these little chronological clues so that we know uh, how to nail um, the historical time into the, into the time of the narration, of the action, of the events. We go jump up to 1983, and while we're in 1983, we hear both about, um, oh, oh, excuse me, in, 19, in, in, in the Motel Siesta, we, in, in that scene, which would, what, be 63 plus four years, or uh, 63 plus four, 1967, we hear a reference back to when um, Ennis was about nine years old, and uh, Earl and Rich were caught and, uh, by the townspeople and were considered to be, um, I don't know what they were considered to be, but they were grabbed at night and tied and dragged by their genitals and killed. They were killed for the assumption of two men living together uh, as, uh, as a couple. Don't want to be that, NS sees at nine, because what happens to guys like that is they get killed and mutilated by the townspeople. Later in 83, we hear the story about all the way back to 19, uh, uh, excuse me, 19, well, they would have been born in 1943, all the way back to the 40s when Jack was potty trained. And he missed the uh, toilet, and his dad, what did his dad do? His dad got up and peed all over him. So we have these weird uh, back and forth references to getting hit um, uh, several years after we have a real time going forward in historical and chronolog chronological time, but we have all these loops and backs and forth in the narrative time of the story. 
This makes it difficult to keep track of things. It makes it difficult because we get these little layers of information about who these guys are, how they live, and the things that they've survived. They sort of accumulate over the course of this short story. And, um, and, and, that, that, and that, that's complicated. We'll talk a little bit later also about how this, you know, why does she do it this way? Why does the author, Annie Prue, decide to do this back and forth narrative time slowly? At one level, I think it's kind of how, how, um, how memory works. We don't, we don't remember things in order. We remember, uh, and certainly as we're sharing our lives with a person that we're falling in love with or falling into relationship with, we also reveal little parts of ourselves over time. So these stories, these tales of the past, they, they show up in moments as Jack and Ennis are becoming more and more known to themselves and to each other in that relationship. So some really interesting difficulties, if, difficulties with the graphicness of the world of these, um, of these characters, difficulty of the time going back and forth. And there may be some more that we'll see as we continue uh, with some of the other uh, interesting parts in our next little bit. See you in a bit.